of tutorials. Scott's our tutorial workaholic. He's given two back to back. <laughs> the first one is on RDDL, which is a language used in the probabilistic track of competition this year and in 2011. Yep. So, um, very interesting talk. And if you want to come along on Wednesday afternoon and find out what the results of the competition are. So, thank you, Scott. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. So, I just want to mention that. Uh, can we turn the volume down a little bit? Yeah. So uh, just when you guys go to break, uh, the room will be locked because we don't want anyone to steal that projector. This is a massive projector. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. To the point of the talk. Um, so who here knows PDDL? Good. Who has heard of Riddle aside from the tutorial announcement? Good, okay, it'll all be new, that's, that's important. Um, okay, so I will assume some knowledge of PDDL because Riddle is sort of my solution to address some drawbacks of PDDL. It does help if you know it. If not, I'll try to explain uh, what was in PDDL before. Okay, so, so you know, Riddle is a new uh, modeling language for stochastic problems. Uh, there was a previous one called probabilistic PDDL. The uh, question is, why do we need a, a, a new language? I mean, did, did, did I just want people to cite my language, or were there, were there actually other reasons to do this? And it turns out there are plenty of other reasons, which this, t this tutorial is about. Um, so, you know, what I realized, you know, having been in the field since 2002, at least in, in, the, in the planning field since two, 2002, is that everyone writes their papers and they benchmark on the IPC problems. So, you know, these problems really can direct five plus years of research. Um, so it's really critical then, I think, that you have the right problems that, that, that you care about. Um, so previously, the, the, the problems in, in, in defined in, in PDDL and probably PDDL have run the competitions and they've defined uh, research. Okay, and, and so, so why is it that, that these benchmarks uh, in these comp competitions drive so much research? It's because it's really painful for PhD students to not only do great research in a new area, but also to design really interesting domains. And trust me, I, I, I know this. So, so what happens is you have a great planner and you go looking for who do I compare to, where do I compare, you say, oh, these competitions are there. And they've got all these problems predefined until you look at them. Okay, so, every, so everyone uses these, these benchmarks and it's great because you can compare on the benchmarks. Um, but, I mean, it really means that we should choose our languages and problems well, right? These competitions have a huge impact. Okay, so the current stochastic domain language is called probabilistic PDDL, probabilistic planning and domain description language. Uh, more expressive than probabilistic strips, if you might know that sort of work. Um, so here's an example of uh, a probabilistic PDL statement. So uh, I have an action that says put all blue blocks on the table. Uh, this one has no parameters or preconditions. It simply says, uh, with probability 0.9, after executing the action, for all blocks, when the block is blue, the block is no longer uh, not on table. Oh, yeah. No, it should be on table. Sorry. Okay. It's, not, it's bad when there's an error on slide three. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, for, forget the not. The, the effect should, should be on table. So, you see that uh, probably PDL t takes the constructs of, of PDL, which includes universal effects for all blocks and conditional effects when blue, right? And can you, 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 you can wrap these effects with the probabilistic statements, okay? So it, it, it's, a, it's a quite straightforward extension where effects can succeed or fail. Um, you can do really nasty things that people t didn't typically take advantage of. Is that you, you, you can nest a probabilistic under a for all to make independent effects. Uh, but the only domain that ever did that in a competition was the one that I defined. Um, it was in a language, Michael Littman and Hakan Yunus allowed for it, but no one actually ever made use of this expressivity. So for the most part, probably PDL basically just said that effects succeed or fail uh, with some probability, so, which is a pretty limited view of stochasticity. Um, not only could PDL uh, model blocks world, if you look at the previous competitions, you also saw color blocks world, exploding blocks world, moving stacks blocks world. Right, Boxford was a very favorite domain. Unfortunately, I think domain designers and the competitions ran out of time towards the end. I, I know what this is like. And you copy an existing domain and you try to make it more interesting. And unfortunately, when, when, when the domain was blocks world, right, there's always so interesting. Uh, you, you can only make it so, so interesting. And I'm not, not, I'm not saying it's not a hard problem. It's a very difficult problem to solve well. Um, 
But the question is, if you have this problem, where do you apply the solution? Well, it turns out block storage is actually quite useful for port logistics. In port logistics, you stack containers on top of each other. And the order that you stack them is quite critical. So block storage is actually useful. Um, but uh, you know, if we have uh, a competition of four block storage problems, you know, where else can we apply these solutions? So logistics is another uh, interesting problem that's come up in the, pre the previous publicly planning com competitions. You know, you've, you've, you've got uh, uh, trucks and airplanes and packages that you need to deliver. Um, so you know, you've got actions like load box on truck and city. Okay, uh, and you know, the, the great thing about probably PDL, which I've carried over to Riddle, is that you, know, you you define these very compact specification in terms of variables, right? Then you instantiate your domains for three tr three trucks, two planes, two boxes, or three thousand trucks, two thousand planes, three thousand boxes, right? That's it's quite easy to instantiate. Um, but if you work in public PDDO, you realize only one truck can move at a time, right? So you know, you know, the, 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 will FedEx really care if you go and you say, well, yeah, if you only have one truck, I mean, if if you can only at any given time move one plane or truck, I can solve your problem, right? They're not going to. Um, now, PDDL realizes this. So PDDL does support concurrency. I, I think the uh, I'll get to this later, but the semantics of, of PDL concurrency is. You can execute concurrent actions so long as their effects don't conflict. Problem is, and, and I'll harp on this throughout this presentation, is that when uh, you have stochastic effects, uh, you know, probabilistically, you will almost always get a conflict. So, so if, if, you, if you have the one load or, or, or uh, fly action can succeed, could succeed or fail, and that could conflict with another one, often you will get conflicts. Um, so for the most part, probably PDL never had concurrency and, and could, could, could never support it in the way that it has been supported in PDL. So this really limits right, how useful this domain is. I don't think FedEx would care about this domain in particular. Okay, so if I don't think we should care about these two problems, like what problems should we care about? Or what extension should we care about? So uh, look at the, the, the Mars River problem. This drove a lot of uh, development in the planning community, especially the, the, continu the continuous domain since 2000. Um, so it's often continuous. You have robots moving around. There's time, robot position, sun angle. Anything you can model about the Mars environment, right, can can can, can be in your state. Uh, it's partially observed, right, uh, and even worse, it's a high dimensionally partially observed problem, right. Uh, elevator control is a sort of a, a very fun problem. Um, I tried modeling. I mean, there is a problem in the IPCC 2008 called elevators, and it's more like a vertical grid world. It's not actually an elevator control problem. Um, so what does the real problem require? Well, you typically have multiple banks of elevators in a, in a, in a, in a large building. Uh, you have sort of random arrivals, Poisson or other distributions uh, that are exogenous, right? That they're not under control of the agent controlling the elevators, right? These things just happen ra randomly and independently. Oh. How did I get there? I have slides, okay. Sorry, guys. Watch out what I hit. Okay, you have a complex objective, minimize some of the wait times perhaps. It could be even be a nonlinear function, squared wait times. You have policy constraints, so for example, elevators can't, can't you know, if, if people are on an elevator and they're going up to the top floor and they get in and the elevator's going up and it suddenly reverses, right? You, you can't do that in practice. It really upsets people. It might be the more efficient policy, right? But you'll get complaints. So elevators don't do this. Have you ever been in an elevator that reversed direction on you? No, right? So, so you, <laughs> you need to do things like policy constraints. Okay. Traffic control is a problem that I started working on 2008, 2009. I'm still working on it. It's quite a painful problem. I, I've actually switched to scheduling now to handle this problem. I've, I've given up on MDPs. Um, but it's concurrent. Uh, you've got multiple lights. You have independent exogenous events. All the cars moving, changing lanes. Um, you know, so, so I mean, in, in inherently, this is a concurrent, a, a concurrent problem. Okay. Also, the way you typically model in practice is you model cells on the road with densities and velocities. And the, 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 dynamics, the, the dynamics here are highly nonlinear. Uh, and again, it's, it's partially observed. Actually, when in the control, you only observe the stop line. You, you, you have an inductive loop of the stop line, says, is there a car there? And that's all you get for your input, typically. I mean, we're, we're trying to change that. The, now there are some cameras that can detect Q lengths and so on. but. At the current time, you only really get the stop line in. input. Okay, so can, can public PDL model any of these problems, right? Mars rovers, which is continuous, 
or um, uh, or traffic control or elevators? And the answer is no. Okay, so so inherently lim limited what what you could do with this language. Okay, so what happened? So let's let's look at ICAP's time. It was Big Bang, and then Strips in '71, sort of one of the first lifted planning languages, right? Then ADL came along and added conditional effects to Strips. PL 1.2 came along in '98, added universal effects like in Blocks World for all Blocks B. Uh, when the block is blue, so that's universal and conditional, right? So that's quite useful. Uh, PDL 2.1 came along in 2003. Uh, very, very nice extensions with numerical fluence, concurrency, exogenous uh, effects. So now, now PDL is becoming really quite useful, right? Uh, unfortunately, when problems like PDL split off, it split off from PDL 1.2, right? And so you got probabilistic universal conditional effects, but you didn't get all this added stuff that was added in. Uh, PDL 2.1. And PDL kept on evolving, right? PDL 2.2 added derived predicates, and, uh, derived predicates and temporal aspects, and 3.0 adds trajectory constraints and preferences. Um, and I guess it's now 3.1. There's object fluence and so on. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, the problem is I think probably PDL branched off quite early when PDL was still quite limited. And and for other reasons, uh, I think when you handle probabilistic concurrency and problems like I'm talking about previously, you actually don't want to use PDDL. Um, and I'll get to that later. OK, so this history is uh, from uh, Malta Helmert's, uh, uh, from this web page. These slides will go online afterwards if you, want to, if you want all the links. OK, so let's take a uh, deeper look at traffic control. This, 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 this was the domain that made me say, OK, I can't model some probabilistic PDDL. I need a new language. Because I tried to write down traffic control problems by generating the problems directly with code, and that was extremely painful. Um, and, and you had to modify the problem because you wanted to add something new, and it was extremely painful. And so I said, I need, I need a whole language to model this problem. Okay, and that it was really the birth of Riddle. So uh, this is a nice simulator. This used to cost about um, two thousand dollars, which isn't bad for a traffic simulator. You know, if you can't control lights in practice, this is what you work with, and it's, it's, it's pretty realistic. You have all the traffic queuing. Uh, this is Australia, so you're driving on the left here. Um, uh, so we we're working with this traffic simulator we, we, we wanted to do control. And we need to model a problem, and we need to find planners that, that can uh, work in it. But mod, mod, modeling the problem is what we're going to focus now. OK, so for this problem, you need unrestricted concurrency, meaning you have to be able to execute actions that could conflict. Cars that independently move should be able to attempt to move into the same lane, right? And there should be some mechanism for resolving whether they can actually achieve that or not. You shouldn't just say, this is impossible, because it's not under your control. It's exogenous. OK. Um, so again, in PDDL, you could have concurrency if you could prove that effects never conflict. But in the, the deterministic world, that's pretty easy. The stochastic world, that's next to impossible. OK, so right. So probably PD, PDL only allows one independent event to affect a fluent. So you, what you really need, and I, I really realize at this point, is that you need something more like a dynamic Bayesian network to handle the concurrent stochastic evolution. So who knows what a dynamic Bayesian network is? OK, so if you don't, I've got to warn you, some of the points in this talk may be a little bit harder to understand, but it's a very useful modeling form of formalism. And ho hopefully, if you don't already know what it is, you'll pick it up as I cover the examples. Okay. But also, I needed a relational one, right? Because in traffic, you've got intersections and cars, and they all sort of act the same way, just with different details. So you need some lifting for it. Okay. So I also need nonlinear stochastic difference equations um, and partial observability, things you, you didn't have in probably. PDL. Now, this is a bit more of a detail, but a quite an important one. Uh, so my planners historically have all been lifted planners. They've, they've tried to analyze the domain at a lifted level uh, to extract structure at that level. And what I found was a huge problem in, 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 in PDL, and probably PDL, is that everything was affluent. Whether it changed or not, it was affluent. So even things like whether one road cell was connected to another cell was affluent, connected. Connected cell one comma cell two. Okay? And if you have a lifted planner that doesn't know things are constant, right? it has to imagine that on every time step, the topology of the network could change. 
uh, you know, maybe if you have drawbridges and so on, that's, that's, that's interesting. But really, uh, it, it's, it's useful to know when things like a connected predicate don't change over time. These are non-fluence. Um, this is a, a just very nice piece of syntactic sugar that I've just added in, 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 uh, in Riddle. And it helps lifted planners for anyone crazy enough to try that approach. OK. Um, I think it's better if I just go into examples and cover all the bullet points. OK, so, so where did Riddle come from? So again, I, I've said that dynamic Bayes nets seem to handle concurrency and conflicting effects a bit better, uh, a bit more naturally uh, than, say, propositions of PDDL. Um, and you, you'll see extensions of dynamic Bayes nets with more structure in the, in the distributions in some fallen work called Spud, Smog Perseus, and so on. Um, and so what I did with Riddle was I took some of the uh, concepts from DBNs and some of the lifting that you would get uh, in, in, in PDDL, and I tried to combine them into a language called the Relational Dynamic Influence Diagram Language. So the DDs are different things now. Okay, so what is a Relational Dynamic Influence Diagram? Okay. Well, here's the non-relational non, non version. Your world state is just a state. These variables are discrete, they're continuous, they're whatever you want, but your state is a vector of state variables. Okay? And from, time to, from t to t plus 1, the variables evolve conditioned on the states of the previous variables in the previous time step. So, so inherently, this is a Markovian language. Um, so in this diagram here, uh, x2 prime depends on, in the next state, depends on x1 and x2 in the previous state. X1 prime depends on just X1 in the previous state. Okay. So this is basically how you draw a dynamic Bayesian network. Um, but the state doesn't only depend on the previous state, it also depends on the actions that are taken. Right? The actions affect the, the evolution of the state variables, at least some of them. The state generates observations right? that can be critical, especially if it's partially observed planning and you only see the observations. Okay? And the state also generates the reward function. So to specify a dynamic, a dynamic Bayes net, I only need to specify what's the distribution of the next state variables given the current action and current state, what's the distribution of the observations given the current state, and what's the distribution of the reward given the current state. Right? I just need to define these three, these three things. State transition, observation function, reward function. Okay? If I've done that, then I have what's called a, a DBN. One thing that might not be immediately apparent here, though, is that the effects in DBNs are independent, right? So, so this can be a, a stochastic effect here of how X1 prime derives from the previous state, and this can also independently stochastically evolve. So it's inherently sort of concurrent, concurrently independent. Okay. And if you know spiders and Perseus, just think of Riddle as the relational version. Okay, so I'll cover the relational aspect later. For right now, I'm going to cover the ground version. So you, you, you won't see any, any relations in, 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 initially. Okay, so just some principles that drove the development of Riddle. So everything is a fluent. So state, observations, actions even. So it's kind of unusual to see actions as fluent, but I treat them as fluent. And you'll see that's a very uniform, nice treatment uh, by the end. Observations and inter intermediate variables, derived predicates, correlated effects, these, these things are all fluent. So it's a very uniform language. Everything is a fluent. A fluent is just a, 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 a uh, state variable, effectively, or some, some sort of variable that can change over time. Okay? And there are also these things called non-fluent, which are very useful for things like topology, that, you know, the, the connectedness of a road network that, that don't change over time. Okay? The fluents can have binary values, integer values, multi-valued, continuous values. Um, that's fairly straightforward. Okay, I'm just going to skip over this. I think if you're looking at the slides after the talk, you can go over this and make it make more sense. I'll go to the examples. Okay, so here's a very simple DBN. I've got P, R, and Q, which are binary variables, and P prime, R prime, and Q prime in the next state, also binary. Uh, if I want to specify a distribution for how, what's the, what, what's the probability that P prime is true given R and P? Okay. Well, if you know DBNs, you, you can use a table, right? So, so P is true with probability 0 0.9 if R, um, sorry, P prime is true, you know, in the, in, in the next state with probability 0 0.9 if uh, P and R are true. But what if P and R are false? 
uh, down here, P naught are false, uh, then, probably, then P prime is true with probably 0.3. Okay? So you can specify the transition distributions for every variable uh, in a table if you want, but if you work with problems like traffic control, this is going to become pretty large pretty quickly. Right? So, you, so you want something more compact than, than a table. Okay? So that's, a, and then that's, a, that's all Riddle gives you, is, is, a, is, a, is a higher level language to specify these conditional effects. So the same distribution back here, right, that's specified in this table, can now be specified in this statement. So this is a, a stochastic program, that's a, effectively a way to sample P prime in the next state given the current state. So um, if P and R are true, right, then P prime is true with probability 0.9. I, I, I draw a um, sample from a Bernoulli variable that has probably 0.9 of being true. Okay, or if P is false or R is false, right, then I get in the other branch and I draw a, uh, a sample from a Bernoulli distribution with probably 0.3 of being true. Okay? So I can specify the, uh, the update to P prime basically as a stochastic program, a, 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 a program that evaluates stochastically. Okay? And again, this stochastic program just translates to this table in the end. So I, 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 I can do this for all the variables, P prime, Q prime, and R prime. And then how do I generate a state update? I just execute the program, right? And it's stochastic. So you get to a leaf and, 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 and you draw a sample. Okay? And I update P prime, Q prime, and R prime in that way. Okay. One thing you'll see throughout Riddle is that if, it, if it's a Boolean variable, so let's look at the, at, at the reward function. Right? The, reward, the reward is a function of Q, R, and P. Um, so one thing that's very notationally convenient in Riddle is that if you have a binary variable, then false is interpreted as zero, and one is uh, true is interpreted as one. So you can always do arithmetic with uh, bin binary variables. So if I want my reward to be, um, uh, to be plus one if P is true, and plus one if Q is true, and minus one if R is true, then you just get the simple expression. Okay? So, and with this compact sort of program, Right, I've specified a, 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 a um, I've specified all the conditional probability distributions and the reward function in Riddle. Okay, this is pretty simple. We're going to get more complex uh, at this point. Though, I want to ask if you don't get what this is doing here, please ask questions because I'm only going to add to this. Okay, so it, so if if people had to write a simulator for this, could they write it? Would you, know, would, you, would you know how to do a state update? If I said in the current state P is true and R is true and, and uh, Q is false, could you write the update for this? Okay, show of hands. Could you write the update for this? Okay, so some people are not entirely sure. Can they tell me what would be unclear? Ah, yeah. Something I've dropped in Riddle too, uh, but it's because it's just Sorry, is this still on? Yep. Um, if you have a, a, a deterministic transition, uh, technically it's like placing all the probability mass on one outcome. Okay? And that's exactly what your delta function gives you. So, so previously, I forced everyone to always use a distribution. So even if you had a deterministic update, uh, then you had, you'd, have, you'd have to use a delta function to do that. Um, however, it annoyed many people. Uh, they didn't quite get it. Um, there was Dirac delta for continuous and Cron delta for discrete. And at the end of the day, the simulator just wraps, if it sees a deterministic update, it just wraps a, a delta function around it uh, transparently to the user. That seemed much more easy. So in, 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 uh, it's no longer required that you use the delta function for a deterministic transition. But if you see a delta, it just means de deterministic. How much is C uh, Conditional probability functions, right? So um, I needed to find the conditional probability of Q prime given Q and R. Okay. Um, P variables, sorry, is parameterized variables. No parameters yet. You'll see parameters later. Um, okay. But does everyone under, so does anyone not understand how the how to evaluate if you know the value of p and r, 
does, ever, does everyone see how to evaluate this? I mean, I mean everyone knows that a Bernoulli distribution is a distribution that generates a, a true or false value with a probability, right? And so I, I evaluate this exactly as I evaluate a program, and I just sample whenever I, whenever I hit a distribution, I sample from it. And that sample becomes the return value that I assign to P prime. Okay, sorry to go slow there, but I just want to make sure everyone understands, because I, I, I'm going to build on this. Okay, so now what happens if you have, you know, more complex dynamic, dynamic Bayesian networks, right, where you some, some of the variables like I1 are integer, or I2 is multivalued, or uh, O2 here, the observation is continuous, right? How, how would I model those? Ooh. Okay. So I've still got PQ and R, which are Boolean variables, Boolean fluence. Now I have intermediate fluence. So the thing with, with, the thing with inter, inter, in, intermediate fluence is these are sort of like maybe stochastic derived predicates. They're things you derive as consequences of the state, but they're not in the state. They help you compute the updates uh, to either the state variables or the observations, especially when you have correlated effects. Because all the updates to variables are independent, if you have correlated effects, you do need in, intermediate variables to sort of store in, intermediate state of, of correlations. Um, so the, the uh, orange variables here are intermediate, and the red ones are observations. So I've got now states, and I've got intermediate fluence, kind of like derived, derived uh, functions, and observations, uh, O1 and O2. I still have a single action. Actions are fluent, so, so, so the action here is either true or false. Okay, and you'll see why I do this later. But uh, you consider an action variable just to be like a state variable, except it's under control of the agent. Uh, not under, uh, it doesn't evolve uh, directly with the system as the state does. Okay, so these are all my fluents. Everything's affluent. That's one principal riddle. I've still got my previous distributions for P, Q, and R. So let's look at the new, dis the new distributions. So if I wanted to say I1 was deterministically equal to P plus Q plus R, right, then I just use this, this, this cron delta wrapper. Or in riddle two, you can just say I1 equals P plus Q plus R and forget the delta. It'll insert that for you. Um, if I want to have a, a discrete distribution, right? So now I2 takes on three values, either low or medium or high. The question is, with what probability does I2 take on these values? Well, if I1 is greater than or equal to 2, then it takes on low probability 0.5, and medium probability 0.2, and high probability 0.3. But if I is less than 2, it takes on low with probability 0.2, medium with 0.5, and high with 0.3. Okay? So, these equations here define what the probabilities are, and then you sample from the discrete with the given probabilities. So I was, I'll sample always high with probability 0.3. Okay. Um, so the ats, uh, the ats are prefixes of uh, enumerated variables. So whenever you have a, a discrete distribution, you're always drawing from an, an, e, an enum. Okay. Uh, so getting more complex, Remember, we saw the Bernoulli previously, right? I draw a sample from a Bernoulli with a probability given by its argument. But the argument can be a function of the state, right? So if P and Q and R are all 1, right, then I draw O1 with, with uh, 1.0 probability being true, right? And if P, Q, and R are all false at 0 plus 0 plus 0, uh, then I draw, uh, then, then the, prob the probability of being true is 0, and the probability of being false is 1. And so uh, I draw O1 with, uh, if P, Q, and R are false, then uh, O1 is deterministically false. Okay. But you know, one nice thing is you can, you, you, you can always nest inside your distributions right, any expression. Okay. And this becomes useful later. Uh, and finally, so if I want to update, so if I have this continuous observation, if I have, a, if I have an enumerated variable like I2 up here, Right, it was an inter intermediate variable. It took on values low, medium, high. I can switch on that. So if it was low, I get this equation. Medium, I get this equation. And high, I get this equation. Okay. Now this is your standard sort of uh, linear Gaussian update. Right? If, if I2 is low, then O2 equals I1 plus 1.0 plus a sample from a normal. Right? The mean is 0, so it's sort of white noise. But the variance is actually a function of the state. 
So you'll see later in Mars Rover, when I'm moving, the farther I move, the more uncertainty I have about where I've ended up, right? And so it helps to actually uh, have your variance be non-constant. And so you can do this again by putting expressions as parameters to your distributions. Um, but again, to, to generate this, I take the value of i1, I add one to it, I take a sample from this normal, and I add that to it as well, okay? So it's sort of just a linear Gaussian system. Okay, any, any questions, Michael? Right, okay, so this was to enforce stratification of the intermediate fluence because uh, I, I2 depends on I1. But can't you kind of just infer it from the structures? Like yes. So it's a, little bit, I mean, it's a little bit painful when you get to lifting, especially if you have self-recursive references. But in Riddle 2, uh, I did add that. So in Riddle 2, you no longer have specified levels. Uh, and you can have you 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 can have self-referencing recursion as long as it enforces a, a DAG structure. So uh, I'll show you this at, at the very end. But yeah, it's a good point. It just it just took me a few years to to get that actually into into the software. And you also said that you can use any kind of expression. Like what what functions have you? Uh, they'll get more complex. I'll, I'll, you know. The funny thing is, I, you know, I, 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 I realized I, I, I can write a long riddle document, but the, at the end of the day, people learn riddle by looking at examples. So, you know, I mean, I, that's probably how anyone learns a program. You, know, you, you don't read that 500-page Python book first. You know, you, you Google for the example that you need. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I, I'll, I'll go to a bunch of examples, and, and I, I, do, I do have a catalog at the end of everything that you can use. Okay. Um, so, so far, I haven't discussed the relational part, right? I've just given you sort of these, these ground uh, variables and, and, and distributions as stochastic programs. Okay, now I'm going to show you where lifting comes in. Okay, so in traffic, I, 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 I needed this. You know, if I'm modeling Sydney traffic, you know, I've got 100 intersections. Uh, there are details of every intersection th that are defined by constants. Uh, but the basic intersection model and how traffic flows through it is pretty straightforward. Um, and then I have a vehicles, right? I mean, you don't want a different model for every vehicle. There may, there may, there may be different braking parameters and so on for different classes of vehicles. But in general, you, you have a class of vehicles, right? So you class of intersections, class of vehicles. How do you instantiate a traffic network for 100 intersections and 100,000 vehicles, right, without specifying every, uh, every instantiation differently, right? You want to use lifting or relations or something uh, along those lines. OK, so I'm not going to show you traffic, it's quite of a painful problem to formalize in a tutorial. Uh, so instead, I'm going to show you something more obvious, I think, which is Game of Life, which is also uh, concurrent and a bit more fun, perhaps, to, to, to watch. So uh, who knows, or who, who, who is not aware of the Game of Life? OK, a few people. OK, so Conway defined this in the 70s. Um, basically, it's a cellular automata. Um, and you have rules for transitions. So a cell is, is on, or black, or true in the next state um, if it has uh, two or three neighbors that are on. How, however, if there's overcrowding, it, uh, or there's not enough neighbors to support reproduction, right? so less than two or greater than three, uh, then a cell dies. Um, and if you have exactly three neighbors and the cell wasn't on in the, in the previous uh, time step, then you can have a cell birth. I don't know why it takes three parents to make a, a child, but it doesn't the game of life. Okay. So these simple rules about how you generate the next state of a cell given the previous state and the neighbors, right? you can generate these, these, these indefinitely propagating patterns. Um, so, so there was a question posed in the 70s as to whether there was any pattern that persisted indefinitely, and the answer is yes, and here, here are, are three examples. And I thought, well, you know, if, this had, if, if Conway had defined this problem in, in 2000, you know, we could have made an, op, an op, op, opposition problem. Um, is there, for initial state, some way to set, to set the cells such that things stay alive indefinitely, if you reward having cells alive? So I actually, I, I made it into an MDP. Um, so, but I, I also made it stochastic, just to make it fun. Uh, so there's some, 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 ran, some randomness to these rules as well. Okay, but the objective is to maximize the number of cells that uh, are on. Sort of an optimization approach to solving this question of whether there are any patterns that could persist. Okay, 
But what I want is a compact real specification that applies to not only a 10 by 10 grid, but a 100 by 100 grid, right? I don't want to have to uh, model every problem differently. So here's a simple 2 by 2. Here's a dy dynamic Bayes net for a simple 2 by 2 grid. I have a cell. Uh, so I, I have four variables, right? Uh, alive, and they're in position x1, y1, position x1, y2. X2, Y2, and X2, Y1. So I have four cells that are Boolean. From this, I want to generate a count of neighbors. So these things here are integers. I want to generate a count of neighbors uh, that are alive, because that's really useful for, uh, for determining the transition, right? Uh, if this is less than or greater than, less than two or, or greater than three, I know this death and so on. So it's always nice to have these interme intermediate variables to, cal to calculate these useful functions. Um, so let's see. So this is a two by two domain, right? Well, what if I wanted 100 by 100? You know, you really don't want to specify every variable independently. You want to use something like this, prim this parameterization that I've done. Okay. And there's another thing is that here's why I specify actions as fluence and not sort of as you know in in, in PDDL you can put a box on a truck, you can do all these things. Um, uh, actions are sort of very different from variables. The reason why actions are fluent here is because uh, I have concurrency. I can independently set every cell. So I have a Boolean variable for setting every, 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 every cell. So rather than having two to the 16 actions, two to the fourth or 16 actions for all joint instantiations of set, I just have variables for each set. Okay. Much more compact encoding when you, when you get to concurrent problems. OK, so how would I specify the update? Um, so you know, count neighbors is, 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 is pretty simple. And here's a, here, here's a function we haven't seen before, which is the sum function. Right? So I want to see how many neighbors x and y has that are alive. So I sum over all x2 and x position and all y2 and y position. Right? And I count. Uh, I, 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 I get 1 every time this is true. Right, x2, y2 is a neighbor, and x2, y2 is alive, and I get zero whenever it's not. Okay, again, all Boolean uh, expressions can evaluate to zero, one, whether they're false or true. Okay, so things like summations are are, are quite convenient for doing things like uh, counting. Okay, and finally, I say when is alive prime true? I think the key things to note, basically, uh, is that there's some more complex things here that you don't have to pay to pay attention to, but a live prime true on, only depends on basically the count of its neighbors, right? Which I've which I've just computed up here. So if the count of its neighbors is greater than or equal to two or less than or equal to three, um, and so on, then I I, I get the certain uh, outcomes. Okay. But this is the idea of lifting uh, that I have now. These fluents have parameters, and I can condition the updates on those parameters. Okay. And that's quite Powerful. Okay. So if I define the instance, basically I just define well, I've got two x positions, two two y positions. Here's, here's my my neighbor, my neighbor relation is non-fluence, and then every, everything works from there. Okay. And why is this useful? Because from the same domain description, right? If I had two positions in this neighbor relationship, I got this DBN. And if I had three positions for x and, and, and y, and this 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 uh, neighbor relation, right? Then I get this DBN. This is only three by three. If it's 100, 100 by 100, right? It's still just say which positions are and generate the adjacency of the positions, right? And you generate amazingly complex DBNs from this very compact um, where, where is it? You know, this very compact stochastic program description. You automatically generate these DBNs. So that's the key power and riddle. And I found when I was on traffic, you just could not write these DBNs by hand. They were just way too painful. But now that you have this language, you can do it quite easily. Okay. And I want to point out that, you know, let's see. These DBNs uh, really are automatically generated. So here's a Mars River problem. I'll get to this later, but here's the specification in riddle. Um, and the software really does generate the DBN. This isn't vaporware. 
So all the software is online. Uh, I'll get this a little bit later, but if you download it, you just compile the Java, and there's a script to do that for you if you don't know how to do it. Uh, and then you literally, as soon as you do that, and it takes like a minute, uh, then you just say, okay, let's take the multi-agent Mars River problem, and let's take one instantiation of it, and let's look at the DBN. Okay, and the software will input the problem, it'll look at the instantiation, it'll say, okay, here's your, here's your DBN. And zoom in on it. I can say, well, what does uh, what what does this depend on? And it'll it'll give you the the stochastic program for it. But for all this for all this language, there is software to support uh, browsing and compiling the base nets and and sim sim sim, sim simulating, etc. Okay. Okay, how long do I have, Andrew? So I've got till 3.15, okay. Trying to decide, I'm going to skip this problem. It'll be in the slides. Let me go on to another continuous problem. I, 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 I just want to take problems that are intuitive, and I want to show you what the riddle looks like for it, so you can sort of get more intuitions as to how riddle works. So, you know, here's a very simplified ver version of the Mars River problems, right? You had robots on Mars, and, and they had scientific experiments planned for a day. Uh, for example, uh, they might have three picture points that they, they, they sort of had to take at, 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 in different time windows, right, depending on the, on, on the sun angle, et cetera, okay? So you could define bounding boxes for uh, ranges in which the robot could take the picture. Uh, and the idea, and the question from the planning perspective is, you know, what's, What's, what's the best path to thread through these picture points at the right times of the day to optimize some objective? Okay. So, uh, pretty straightforward problem, but actually, if you know continuous planning, uh, not a trivial one to solve. Okay. So this, uh, you know, this trajectory actually might be the optimal one, right? So just go to the lower right-hand corner of this box, right, and then go into this point, which can actually take a picture of both points two and three. Right? So finding these paths, uh, uh, the alpha paths, is actually not trivial. Um, okay, but planning is a different topic. That's for the next tutorial. Uh, this tutorial is only about uh, model modeling the problem. Okay, so for this Mars River problem, what do I have? I have the only object here. I've got one Mars River for now. The only object here is the picture point, right? And I can have as many picture points as I want. So that's my, that's my object. Okay, and then for every picture point, it has an X position and a Y position. It has a value. What's the value, the, the, the relative value of taking this picture? And uh, what's the error allowed in terms of the, of the bounding box uh, from the center position? Uh, so that, that, that can vary based on the picture point. The robot doesn't have any parameters, just one for now, X position and Y position. And time is a continuous variable. Right? So if, if, you, if you move a very long distance, that takes more time. Time will update according to the distance that, that, that you move. Okay? Your, your three actions, not necessarily independent, are an X move and a Y move, which are continuous action fluence. Um, should be executed sort of together. And to snap, to, to snap a picture, which cannot be concurrently done with a move. Uh, so you, you, you either move from a continuous uh, amount or you snap a picture where you are. Oh, okay. So the X position and Y position update pretty simply, right? Just the current position plus how far you moved, plus some variance. And I said earlier, again, the farther you move, uh, the more you want to, uh, the, the, the more noise you want to have in your, in your error, right? So that, that's why the variance is sort of dependent upon the, uh, the size of the move. Now, who can spot the error in this domain? You simulate this, uh, it'll randomly throw an exception. So I didn't say X move and Y move had to be positive, right? So what would happen if X move was negative here? Any problems? Any problem with the variance being negative? Yeah, okay. So actually, what you need is an absolute value here. In, in Riddle 2, 
we used to have all these if statements to handle things like absolute values, which is quite painful. In RIDDLE 2, we just add, add, added all of those statements in. So uh, in RIDDLE 2, you can actually just wrap x move with an absolute value. Okay. Um, so this isn't quite right. Uh, the time, if you snap a picture, that, that takes deterministically uh, 0.25 uh, of an hour, a, a quarter hour. So um, if, you say, if, you see, if you snap a picture, uh, then time prime equals time plus the current time plus a quarter hour. However, if you move, right, um, then it depends on how far you move. Now, here you'll see a Manhattan distance encoding. Uh, at the very end, I'll show you an a Euclidean distance encoding, uh, which does take some contracts from Riddle 2. But, okay. but again, the idea here is that, is that the, uh, the amount of time a move takes, it depends on how far you've moved. And this, this if statement here is an absolute value. If it's greater than zero, then it's take, take the value. If it's, if it's less than zero, take the negative value which you can also get rid of as well. OK. Here's the award. So th let me go back to the problem, right? If I was in this point, I would actually, and I stopped the picture, I would actually get credit both for picture point two and picture point three. So I need some reward that can code that. OK. So if you stop a picture and time is less than the max time, right, before the sun goes down, then sum over all the picture points. And if your current position is within the bounding box of that picture point, where you're summing over them all, then you get the value for that picture. The sums over all pictures, and if you're in the box, you get the value for the picture. Otherwise, you get zero. Okay? So this is a very compact way to encode that reward. And finally, something I haven't, I haven't discussed before, but um, in many domains, you want to have uh, constraints on the, uh, on the action. So because Riddle allows concurrency, you don't, uh, you don't put preconditions directly on the actions. You, you, you can only say that, that jointly some action configurations are illegal. So all the preconditions for actions now get moved into a section called state action constraints, uh, where you can handle sort of uh, what's concurrently al allowable. So basically, I'm just saying, if you, if you snap picture is true, then it implies that you didn't move it. You, you, you didn't move it all. OK. This is probably be an equivalent. No, no, no. But moving, moving, moving wouldn't, not moving wouldn't imply the chair. You had to, you had to snap a picture. OK, I'm going to skip this. It's a little bit complex. OK, so in Riddle, everything's affluent. And you have binary, multivalued, integer, and continuous fluence. So let's see. Michael asked about the expressions. You have and, or, you know, all your logical expressions. You can have for all and, and Existentials over the variables in the domain, um, all the arithmetic functions, uh, inequalities, disequalities, equality, if then else, and switch statements, switches for uh, discrete variables or enumerated variables, uh, and some basic probability distribution. And this is Riddle 1. You'll see here in a second that Riddle 2 got a lot more expressive. Okay. Um, so let me go on to Riddle 2. So this is, like, I'm probably going to finish early. And I don't think anyone would mind if I finish early. This gets quite painful very quickly. Um, so Thomas Keller worked uh, at Freiburg, worked with Riddle for uh, a few years, modeling many domains. And he said, you know, it's a cool language, but I, there's lots of changes I would like to make to facilitate modeling. So we got together, and we defined Riddle 2. Um, and so n now we've added in all these functions that you need, you know, exponential square root and so on. Uh, the absolute value, which is quite critical in, in many domains. We added vectors. Uh, and this is actually, when you have multivariate normals and multi mul multinomials, especially with a, like a, a multinomial, like you, 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 you sample uh, six samples from a six-sided die, right? That, that sample is a vector, right? It's really, you, you can't really sample the different values independently. So some, some distributions we realized you, you needed vectors, and so we've, we've added this in. Um, object fluence uh, can be quite painful to handle as a planner, but uh, are quite useful for domain modeling. Uh, and I'll show you examples of these rather than um, harp, harp on them too long. You'll note this annoys, this annoys Thomas and some, some other folks, but we now have a problem that parameter-free fluence are impossible to distinguish from object names because they look the same. 
So basically, I do auto casting where possible. If there's only one, if, if an expression, something has to be affluent or has to be an object name, uh, I, I just implicitly uh, figure out which one it is. But in some cases, you can't. And so there is a dollar sign that now appears in Riddle 2 that annoys some people. But it's basically because with this language extension, I've got, I've got a, so the, the dollar sign is sort of a cast to say this is an object name. I now bound it in integers, and so now um, for type checking, you do sort of need to, to differentiate when you have a normal integer that has no range versus a bound range, range integer. Again, for the most part, you don't have to worry about this, but occasionally you will have to use this notation. Um, so just be aware if you look at Riddle 2 and you see this, there is a reason why it's there. Uh, so one thing Thomas pointed out was that we were calling the intermediate fluence derived predicates. But it turns out that um, the intermediate fluence were generated only on the state update. And if you wanted to, in your action preconditions, uh, check things like derived fluent, you'd have to have some separate fluent that was computed as the state was updated, not once, or as you reached a state. Um, so we now have these derived fluents, which are just like intermediate fluence, except that they're deterministic and they're, com they're computed exactly uh, immediately when you enter a new state, these things are, 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 are derived. You don't have to wait until you have the action to figure out uh, what the value of these things are. Um, lots of people, lot, many, many people, not just Thomas, have asked for indefinite horizon, goal-oriented problems. So finally, we've, we've added that in. And as Michael pointed out, um, you know, well, so I, I now allow recursion. A fluent can refer to a fluent to, to its own name as long as, have different, as long as it just has different parameters and those references define a DAG. And I'll show you what that means in a, in a second. OK, so for Riddle 2, let me just show you some of the things that you can do. Um, I will give you links in the slides here. There are three competitions that have run with Riddle, two discrete competitions and one continuous competition that's actually held over till next year, but there are lots of domains already online, uh, where you can look at tons of examples. And, and I think if you're going to learn Riddle, download the software, look at the examples, run it. It's really easy. Uh, the, the README basically has instructions on how, how, to, how to run the different examples. Um, but we did a better version of Mars Rover where we said no longer do we have bounding boxes, we now have general ellipses uh, for, the, for the picture points. Um, and so this example adds in vectors. So now a point can be a 2D vector where it takes, uh, it, 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 it's a vector with one element labeled x, it's a real value, and one element labeled y that's, uh, that's also real. If you go down to the update, you see here's the update. And basically, I, I can just break out the update for a vector into its components. Here's the x component, and here's the y component. Right? Okay. Here it's just syntactic sugar, but when you have a multivariate normal or you have a, 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 a multinomial, you actually need this. Also, you can do operations directly on vectors. Um, so you can do ve vector arithmetic. Uh, and you can nest vectors. So you get matrices, you can get tensors, um, and so on. Uh, there are labels on all of the indices, so there is type checking when you add two vectors that the indices have the same labels, which is quite useful for debugging, because it's very easy to add vectors of different types and not realize you did it. Um, okay, now let's, let's look at this interesting equation here. Okay, can anyone tell me what the heck this thing is doing? So it's, it, the name of this fluent is picture reward possible. Can robot R take a picture of picture point P? So before I had bounding boxes, now I want to do ellipses. So to do ellipses, you've got to do something like, more like a Euclidean distance. In fact, let, 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 I, I think, sorry, this version is just circles. Um, so it's a fixed radius. Okay, so now the position is a vector. Okay, but how would you take Euclidean distance, right? You, you, you sum over all the dimensions, you square it, and then you take the square root. Okay, and that's what you see here. I take the square root, I sum over all dimensions. Uh, remember, the dimensions are x and y. And I take the difference of the uh, current robot position and the picture point in that dimension, and I square it. That's what the PAL function is doing. Okay, I sum that over all dimensions, and then I square root it. So this is actually just Euclidean distance encoded as uh, directly. Okay. But so one nice thing you can, you can do with vectors is you can iterate over the indices if you know the space, the namespace of those indices. In this case, dim 2D was defined as at x and at, and at, and at y. Um, this notation is a little bit old. 
uh, now we actually refer, we, we, we require that you, you, you say from what namespace does the vector draw its labels. Uh, so now point two, 2D will actually have, will, will specify dim 2D as the namespace for the, for the, for its, its um, elements. Okay, so this is with vectors, and if I run this domain, so I, you know, I, I, I found with traffic and, and other domains, if you don't visualize your domain and your planner performance in, 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 in that domain, you've probably either made a bug in the, in the domain design, or your planner is doing something really stupid and you didn't realize it, right? Visualization is critical, and yet I find most students avoid it because it takes time, right? Um, but I made it really easy in the Riddle software uh, where you just define a class that just looks at the state and, and visualizes it. So here from Mars Rover, I've done that. Okay. So the state's evolving, and then there's a, a, a class that just knows how to visualize what the state is. So if you have any planner, right, um, uh, you, you can always run the server with the visualization. Here we have, I think, three robots moving concurrently. Uh, you can see the picture points were defined as ellipses. Uh, you, you've got a red circle if you took a picture within the ellipse. Of course, whenever, whenever you're outside, outside ellipse, you stop the picture, you always get black. Um, this is a random policy, so, so if, you just, if it's not doing anything sensible, there's a reason. Um, but you know, this, this, this allows you to, to realize that the robots are moving in the right way, nothing's going wrong, that they are getting the rewards in, in, in the right place. This is really, really, really critical. Um, you know, a, another domain where we made a massive mistakes, we didn't realize it until we visualized it, was traffic. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. So I said traffic has nonlinear updates. If you want to read all about traffic and how to model it, um, I had a brilliant student, now working with Peter Bartlett, uh, who wrote this report. It's linked in the file. By the way, all these problems are linked from the continuous page and the continuous page link. This is the continuous competition page. Uh, this will carry over to next year because no one, no one can play on this year in the continuous domain. It's quite complex. Uh, but uh, these links will be in the slide, and uh, you'll see the traffic and Mars rover and uh, another power, gen power generation example. You'll see links to the riddle. So I won't tell you all about traffic. Uh, but this is why I didn't show it in the slides. The, the update is actually quite an ugly nonlinear update. Okay? But again, this is still lifted. This handles any number of traffic cells, any number of intersections. And this traffic control. Okay. And here's the visualization. So again, the idea of this, with these models is you divide the road into cells. They have densities and velocities. And over time, you sort of see how the, the, the densities start to uh, back up. You'll see the lights, the, the density starts start to back up the lights. And the, and, 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 the, and the important thing in traffic is you've got to, you've got to manage traffic density. Uh, because when traffic reaches GM density, the velocity is zero, right? So traffic is a highly nonlinear non domain. Anyways, we had lots of bugs in this domain until we actually visualized and realized what was going wrong. You know, you'd have random cells getting dense when they shouldn't be, right? And you easily see, see that in the visualization. Okay. But again, there's a hook. There's just a class that just reads the state and just plots it. It's, 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 it's quite easy. Um, and recursion is the last thing I want to do. Um, so just for Michael. So here's an example of a recursive definition. Um, I have a robot index one. And you'll note basically that it just refers to robot index one. But of a non-fluent defined as the, previous, the, the predecessor of the current robot R. So this enforces sort of that there is some DAG constraint. Uh, but the Compiler now will read in this definition. Do I have it here? Traffic. One sec. So if you download the software, you'll see this file called install.txt. It tells you how to compile. Just two scripts there if you don't know how to compile Java. Um, and then it gives you all these things that 
literally run out, out, out of the box. So you can have this, everything I'm showing you here, you can have running in, in under five minutes on your own machine. Um, and where was the language extension example? This one. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to compile the DBN for this problem. And I'm just going to go down to the corner here where I had this recursive reference of robot index 1, R4, on R3, on R2, on R1. And basically, the, the Debian compiler figured that out from the uh, recursive definition that's given here. Okay. So this is, this is quite useful for, for many things. Uh, in traffic, it, it, it allows basically cars to condition their actions on the cars in front of them or behind them. Right? And for any configuration of cars, there's always a, a, a known behind or in front. Funny thing is that can actually change over time. But this, 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 this can handle that. OK, back to the slides. Near the end, folks. Oh, I'm going to riddle three. Oh, OK. So um, there are a ton of domain examples. These will be in the, the links will be in the slides. But there are two, two discrete, two discrete co competitions that have run. Uh, this year, we had some cool problems like wildfire, which I think Michael's worked on a bit from, from Tom Dieterich uh, at Oregon State, and um, the, continu the continuous problems, the, Mar the Mars rover, and some, some power generation problems that are start starting to become uh, of interest in ICAP. So you'll see all these at the following links if you want to see how they're modeled. Uh, and again, you can run the simulations for them all out of the box. Now, if you can plan for them, let me know, because you should run in this competition. Got lots of ideas for other domains. You can just look at the slides later. Uh, will there be a riddle three? What's missing? You know, one thing I've noticed is that the effects-based specification of, of PDDL is very convenient in many cases, right? And the one thing that I regret in riddle is that it's very hard to write an effects-based specification. You always, you always take it. You always write your, your your updates from the perspective of the variable being updated, right? And so it, it can be very unintuitive sometimes to write those updates. Um, whereas in PDDL, you said, you know, this action has these effects. It's quite straightforward. And so, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. Is there a way to combine? But the, the, the problem with the effects is that they conflict. And the way you write Riddle, you can never have, conf you can never have conflicts. You always get a deterministic update to, or you always get a, a, you always get a, a fixed update to a variable. Um, you could never get multiple executions of a stochastic. Uh, if you sample a stochastic program once, you're going to get one sample. Um, so you don't get conflicts there. but uh, it's not as convenient to write it in that way. So I, I've always wondered, is, is there a hybrid of the way you write Riddle in a very update, state, state variable update approach with the effects-based uh, specification that, that you get in PDDL? If that interests you, talk to me afterwards. Um, and when I, when I had to encode triangle tire world in Riddle, I, I really saw that this is really needed. It's very compact in PDDL. It's quite painful to write in, in Riddle, actually. Um, another interesting thing are time processes. Uh, so I've been talking to Brian Williams a lot recently. Uh, he's worked on time processes and, and control, which inherently handle time and concurrency. Time and concurrency are very hard, I think, to handle together. Um, but but the, the time processes do that. You know? And so should we simply use languages like RMPL from Williams, uh, or are there sort of hybrids for stochasticity? So I think RMPL was deterministic, or at least non-deterministic. Uh, are there hybrids of the stochastic updates that you get in Riddle with things like time processes and, and, and RMPL? Um, huge open question, but it would, would be interesting for future work. OK. So enjoy Riddle. There's no lack of difficult problems to solve. And, and now I hope that you uh, actually have the language to model them. Thank you. I think for most people, you probably want to go to the website, look at the domains, run the simulator. I'm not sure uh, <laughs> after that long talk, everyone can fully understand Riddle. But I do encourage you to go to the, the web pages. When I tried to solve Monty keys, it's important to know the initial state distribution. Yeah. Do you allow that? Yeah, well, OK. So, so currently in Riddle, there is an initial state. So you, um, there's no support just for lack of time to implement it. No, no, no support for specifying a, a distribution, uh, but there is a, a, a known initial state. However, is it really critical in your domain that you have a distribution and not a known initial state? 
or would you be happy with it with an initial state? Yeah. You could you could get around it by having some initial state that then transitions probabilistically to a, a real initial state. Yes, yeah, true. I mean, I mean, it, it, although it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a trivial thing to handle in the language, right? It's just that I haven't done it. Most most people have said they they actually know the state that they have to plan for, so they're they're happy with that. But um, if you needed if you absolutely needed a distribution, I would make the enhancement for that. In fact, I should just do it anyways. Yeah, so in the discrete competition, there have been both uh, MDP and POMDP competitors. Okay, guys. Well, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it.